Today I'm comparing two games that came out in the second half of 2023 that share many design elements. They feel rather similar on the table, although the differences are important and they lead to different feelings for how the games play out and how I think you would approach them when you are playing them. Those games are Balloon Pop by Miko Punicalio and publisher Laura Pellet, and Rife for the Insel by Reiner Knizia and Zock Verlag. Both of these are review copies. I played this three times with two and three players, played this twice with three and four players. So some experience, not full experience. This goes three to six, so I'm missing out on the high player count, which I think would make a real difference, but I can still talk about the two of them, and give you some takeaway. Now, both of these games give each player a hand of cards, one to 10 here and zero to 10 here. Each turn, you're going to play one card to the table to get something, and you add it to your personal display, and then things are gonna happen, and ideally, you're gonna end up with the most points. So those are the similarities, but what are the individual choices that make them different? Each player in Balloon Pop has their own player board where they will place balloons that subsequently pop. They have a set of cards numbered one to 10 with symbols on them with one and two having the same symbols and three and four and so on up to nine and 10. Their meaning will become clear in a moment. The game lasts eight rounds and each of the rounds you're going to draw sets of four balloons from the bag with as many sets as the number of players. So in a two player game, two sets of four balloons. And ideally you draw them out and put them in a line. You can pull them out one at a time. If your hands are big enough, you can arrange them in your hand and then set them out that way. Okay. You now have a designated start player. That player plays a card from their hand face up on the table and each player plays a card in turn. And then from order high to low, you claim one of the sets of balloons. If there's a tie, then it's broken by whoever is holding the first player marker. And that will pass clockwise around the table. The card that you put down shows the way that you have to place these balloons on your board. So if you are bidding higher numbers, then you have to place the balloons vertically, which is a little harder to manipulate how they're going to move later. That will only become clear in time. If you play eight, you can put them horizontally and you can put them in either order this way or flip them around this way. You can't change the individual order of the balloons. If you have a four, you can pop one on the end. If you have a two or three, you can pop one in the middle. Okay. So let's just say we're going to bid something and I'll put these here and the other player puts this here. We're going to ignore what we're bidding right now. Don't worry about that. Whatever card you bid is out. Once you put the balloons on the board, they float to the top. So if you have a column, it goes like this. And now we're going to have another round. You notice these are somewhat similar blocks. The colors don't matter except for making groups. So having a set of one, two, and one is pretty much the same as having two, two, and one. You have, whoa, some with stars, some wild as well. So this is a yellow with a star, yellow without a star. Hmm, the stars form their, form their own groups, as do colors. A white counts as every color. It does not count as a star. So let's say we're going to bid. This is a very unusual arrangement. Anytime you have a group of balloons that has four or more of the same color or two or more with stars, it will pop once you put it on the board. So once someone puts this on their board, these balloons will pop. When you score, you are going to remove one point from the number of starred balloons and you score that many points. So if we pop four starred balloons, that's three points. If you pop four colored balloons, that is two points because you subtract two from that. So you have these situations that come up in the game where someone is staring at this, knowing they're going to get three points as soon as they put this on the board. They may or may not want to do that, but that's what happens. Now, I can point out one way that you don't score points. Let's say this player wins the bid. They could put these here, they float up, they all pop, three points for yellow, and that's that. Alternatively, if they won the bid and were able to place them horizontally, and this popping of balloons is optional, it is not required, 
You can put it like this. And when the balloons float up to the top, they split. And they float up as far as they can this way. Okay. So if this one were here, for example, it would float up and this blue one would go to the top and the other three go here. After you finish, now you're looking at this. We don't have any color groups. We have three yellow and three red, but you need at least four of a color in order to pop a color. You do have two here. This will pop and you get one point. So why do you want to do that as opposed to getting three points all at once? Maybe you're trying to build up to cascade later on, depending on what comes out of the bag. So you have another round. Green will be first bidder again. Again, I'm not, whoops, not showing cards. Whatever card you bid is out. So you have to keep track of that a little bit. How restricted are you in terms of what you're bidding and where things are going to go? Okay. So looking here, this player, if they get these, they could flip this around. Actually, they don't even have to flip this around. If they put this here and floated them all up, all of the red are going to pop, and then the yellow will now be nested with the other yellow. So you can plan a little bit how things are going to score in order to build up potential scoring for the future. Hmm, you can do that. You could instead, well, if it were, they were like this, it would float up this way, which is terrible because now you got a lone red blocking the yellow. Okay, if you did it this way, now you're gonna have the green disconnecting the yellow. So, all sorts of opportunities like that. If this player won, maybe they wanna put them this way. They would float up like so. The yellow would score, the green would score, and then the red would be left up top. There's not much there. So there's options. There's different possibilities for how you want to place things. Or maybe you do it this way. You hope to come up with a red later, and then you're going to try to group everything else together. Do this for eight rounds, and whoever has the most points wins. There is one final bit of scoring at the end of the game. Ideally, you're going to shrink your board as much as possible because at the end of the game, let's say you end up with something like this, then for each column that is empty, you score a point. And each row that's empty, you score three points. So something like this, great, you get four points, but you've blown all the big bonuses here. As I mentioned, I've played Balloon Pop three times so far, twice with three players and once with two, and I don't recall in any of those games anyone scoring more than 25 points, which is perhaps weird because the scoreboard goes up to 50, so possibly we're just terrible players. You have 15 bonus points that you can get if you clear your board, and if you clear your board, you're definitely getting more points anyway because you're scoring those balloons. So we haven't come close to doing that, so we're giving up most of the bonus points and the points for whatever balloons we leave behind. Hmm, possibly we're not good. Again, only three games. That said, luck seems to play a huge role in your chance of success in the game because you have only eight rounds available to you and you have to hope that the things come out that are going to work with whatever you're building. Sometimes you will have to take a set of balloons that includes two of a color or two stars and whatever way you're going to put them up, it's going to pop something, even if you didn't want it popped at that time, because ideally you don't pop four at a time, because if you pop four of a color, you have to subtract two, you only get two points. If you can somehow arrange it and do things so that you pop seven at a time, that's five points. So that's more points per balloon. That's a better way to score. It's more efficient. You don't want to think in Euro game terms of points per balloon, but you're dependent upon the luck of what comes out of the bag and whether you get it or not. Whether you get it depends on what cards you hold, what you can bid and so forth, but also does it just come out of the bag to begin with? In one of my games, I built up this structure that was going to be oh so good in terms of shrinking down, just collapse everything. Kind of like in Tetris, how you build big structures and you're just waiting for the right brick to come down and remove all these rows at once. It's that type of feel in the game. But in the last four rounds, didn't get the red balloon I needed in the right position in order to collapse 
the main group and then get another group after that. So my score was terrible. My fault for setting up and hoping something would result from that. But that was it in the game. Eight turns, bum, 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 done. So it felt like I was just waiting and then the game ended. Again, it's on me for setting up that condition, but the game is relatively short. So maybe you don't want to do that. You just want to knock things out as quick as you can. The feel is a bit like Diamant or Ink and Gold, if you play that, the design from Bruno Faiduti and Alan R. Moon, where you're exploring caves and you have a group of people going into a cave and you're going to flip a card each turn and sometimes there's gems and sometimes there's, there's threats. And if there's gems, you split the gems among all the players, but you get to keep those gems only if you run back to camp. But when you run back to camp, you pick up any gems dropped along the way. But as other people run back to camp and you keep going, you get a bigger share of whatever is revealed. So you have this incentive to just go further and go further, further. And at some point, if a trap, if a thread is revealed a second time, then poof, you score nothing from that cave. So you want to go back at some point. But there's some people, such as my wife, who just love to gamble and just keep going. They want to be the only one left in the cave and they want to get a ton of gems for themselves. And they'll just push and push and push and end often most games with an incredibly low score. And sometimes though, the gamble pays off huge and it's a crushing victory. Just the points way higher than anyone else. But that game lasts many more turns than eight. So you have this possibility of weighing what's coming up and who's still in the temple. And maybe sometimes she'll actually run away and then get a big haul because the other person is sure that she's going to keep going. And so they want to weigh what they're getting. So feels the same a bit in how you can gamble, but it's incredibly short. And so you just have to be prepared for that. And eh, sometimes it doesn't work. And then so maybe you play again and see how things come up. It's a little disappointing when you have the starred things together and you know they're going to score because you don't get to build towards something else. You have a forced scoring, which could take away from what you're actually trying to do, which is to build this big cascade. You don't want to just put two balloons, two star balloons together, because that's one point. Again, you want to build a cluster somehow and then fit it all in and move everything at once. You just don't have enough turns probably to make that happen or enough control. So there's Balloon Pop. Now let's look at Rife for the Ensign. Each player in Rife for the Ensign gets their own player board. You have a bag from which you will draw tokens and you have your own set of player cards. In this case, numbered from zero to seven and 10. Eight and nine, not part of what you're getting. So similar elements to what we have in Balloon Pop. The game lasts three rounds and each round lasts at most five turns. At minimum, there'll be five turns in the entire game. At maximum, 15. I'll explain how. On a turn, you're going to draw as many bananas from the bag as the number of players. And bananas come, in general, in three colors. Brown, yellow, green. If you're colorblind, not sure if this will be clear to you. i got, got other issues with colorblindness, too. We'll talk about in a moment. So this is worth four points. Five points. This is 15 slash two. If you get two of these, it's worth 15 points. If you get one of them, it's worth nothing. Similar to this, 20 and two. Okay. You put up as many lots as the number of players, just like Balloon Pop. In player order, you're going to place a card by one of the lots. So maybe I place a zero here. Each player in turn, puts down a card, you can put down any number, but if you put down a card in a lot where someone else is, you have to put down a higher number. So this player can put a zero or any number next to the four or the five or the 20 slash two, but to go here, it's one or higher. Okay, let's say they go zero here and another player says one here and then we'll get zero. Okay. If it comes back around to you and you have been outbid, take your card, put it back in your hand, and now overbid someone else or go here with the zero. No reason to bid higher than zero if you don't have to. If I overbid here, 
then yellow skips their turn because they already have a bid. They're not being overbid. We'll get around to purple. Purple will take their zero back. And then again, overbid or go here. That's the flow of every round. And sometimes the bidding is low and sometimes you have real competition for what's out there, especially at the end of the game. Once everyone has bid on a separate banana lot, they're going to put the bananas in an empty space. Okay, so let's say here and here and here and here. Anyone who's bid a zero, they get their card back. Anyone who's bid a non-zero, those cards are gone. So your bidding options are reduced over the course of the game. Just like in Balloon Pop, you're going to bid with a number and then it goes away. The zero sticks around. So whoever took the last bid, the gets the banana card and they will be the first bidder for the next round. So put out a banana, we got five, five, 14. Oh, and a parrot. Hmm, that's different. When you get a parrot, you put it down below the next row. So you're still gonna have a banana here, but now it's a banana with a parrot. That's not good. You're going to bid for these as well. And eventually you're going to fill up your island. So let's say this goes here. When you take a lot with a parrot, you just put the parrot to the side. And let's say you fill up your island. Uh, I'm gonna look through the bag and pull out things for examples here. Here, here, here. Okay. At the end of the first round, if there are any parrots next to your island and you have a banana, one or more bananas of the same color as the parrot, that parrot flies away with a banana of your choice. So this goes away. Just, I fed the parrot. Didn't want to, but didn't have a choice. After that, you're going to score only the brown bananas because only the brown bananas are ripe. Yellow ones, not ripe yet. Green ones, really not ripe yet. So I'd score only the brown. You just stack it up here. And these spots stay filled. So players are going to score different numbers of tokens depending on whether they got brown or whether they got something else. If this player ended up with four brown bananas and the yellow, they're gonna have a stack of four here and only one token left. Now you're gonna start the second round. This player has room for four tokens. Let's put out tokens again. We're gonna bid. Uh, let's say we go here. And then we're gonna have another round. I'm just gonna put out things somewhat randomly right now. There's yellow parrots as well. There's also black bananas, which are overripe and worth negative points. If you get a black banana, it takes up a spot and it's going to cost you points at the end of the round. So let's say this player is full now. We've had two bids. This player is acquired two. This is player is acquired two. Now their spot is filled. Well. In the future, they are going to either throw away the thing they get or throw out something else. So if this player ends up getting the 10, they probably will throw away the two. They might throw away the four as well, or this four, but the two is the, the best choice. If they get the 20 over two, super. If they get the eight, eh. Well, maybe you don't want to score it just yet. If you get this, it's got a parrot. So it's essentially getting nothing because you're going to throw away that three. This is a null bid, unless you already have other browns. So not the best arrangement. There's parrots in each color. So you're trying to upgrade what you already have. This player has two open slots and doesn't have to throw anything away. So possibly you want to score as many things as you can in the first round to leave more open slots so that you can get more stuff. But the brown bananas tend to be the least valuable. Hmm. If you get the yellows, they're generally worth a little bit more, but you got to wait around. And now at the end of the second round, once all these spots are filled, you score the brown and the yellow. The yellow are now ripe. So this player will clear, clear out four slots. This player will fill out clear out three, including the black one. Mm, okay, they got room for four, they got room for three, and we're gonna keep going. There's one other special tile I haven't talked about yet. It's the thunderstorm. So if a thunderstorm comes out at any point, let's say we got five, 
We got a two. I draw a thunderstorm. Okay, leave that out. Keep going. Still have four lots. Oh, we got a parrot. You can end up having multiple parrots in a slot. That's okay. Okay, all brown this time. The thunderstorm means storm is coming, lightning can come out. You don't want to waste time bidding on here. You're going to bid simultaneously. And whoever put out the highest bid chooses first, and so on. With ties broken clockwise from the banana. There you go. There's a few thunderstorms in there. Sometimes you'll get thunderstorms in at once. Doesn't matter. It's still lightning round. Just go through it. Okay. And whoever is last to pick gets the banana again. At the end of the third round, you score all the bananas. If you have a black one down here, you can't get rid of it. So even if your board is filled and you win other banana lots, you can't throw this away and replace it with something else. I'm sorry, you are tainted with black bananas. You have to keep them. You made your choice. You didn't bid high enough not to take that. So now you're gonna have to eat it or at least keep it on your island. If you have parrots and you don't have banana of that color, it sticks around until later. It demands bananas. So maybe you just never get a brown one again. At the end of the game, you're gonna have your stack of tokens, everything you scored at the end of the first, second, and third round, and whatever cards you have left in your hand, those are worth points as well, as many points as the number on the card. So you wanna be super efficient in what you're bidding because you're throwing away points in order to get other points. And how valuable is it to you to get one of these tokens over another. The one, two, five, five, ew, those are not great. But of course, if I get this with a zero and you get that with a zero, then I made out a little better. So maybe you do wanna spend something just to keep me from getting this. You all have to decide what you wanna bid. Once you bid that one, if you win with it, it's gone. And so now you're out of that option in the future. I know I can put a zero on something that you want. You're going to have to bid at least two to overbid me. Hmm. Consideration to keep in mind when you're playing. As I mentioned, I played Ripe for the Insel, that is Ripe for the Island, twice so far, once with three players and once with four. And while it has many similar elements to Balloon Pop, it feels like they come together in a more complete and developed way in this game in a way that gives me more control over the end result, over the success that I have in the game, it's up to me because I've got more chances to do what I wanna do. It may not be a smart thing that I'm trying to do, but I can do it. So it gives me a greater feeling of control. We'll see at the end of the game whether I made good choices or not. Although it's hard to tell because of course, one choice cascades into another and it affects how other people bid and what other people collect. As I mentioned, Balloon Pop lasts eight turns, right for the insult, five to 15 turns. But as soon as someone takes a brown banana in the first round, well, you know there's gonna be at least one round of bidding in the second round. And then if they have two brown, two rounds of bidding, three brown, three rounds of bidding. So you can plan ahead a little bit or think about that as you're collecting other things. How much are you going to score and clear out? How much room are you making for yourself? How valuable is it? And that calculation can come into play in terms of what you're bidding. Because in the first round, if you're getting yellow and green, they're just gonna sit there and take up space. So how much are you paying relative to what you're getting? What you can earn from that slot on your island over three rounds, if you're scoring a little bit at a time compared to a lot later. It's hard to tell based on two games of experience, but it does give you more to think about in terms of what you're paying and how you're competing with someone. Whether you wanna gamble on the 22 or the 15-2 bananas, how much time do you have to find another one? And how many players are in the game? Because the more players there, there are, the more tiles you're going to pull out of the bag, which will increase the odds of you getting that. Mm -hmm. Except of course, with more players, you might be competing with other people to get those particular bananas. There's multiples, there's more than just two in the entire bag. But of course, if I have one and you have one and another comes up, we're gonna be competing a bit more and maybe everyone else makes off. Maybe you don't wanna get in that, maybe you do. Maybe you have the only one. It's more to think about in terms of how you can score. In addition, how you're bidding. So it's more interesting. There's more dynamic elements to it 
And in addition, you have not just a single round of card play, but multiple rounds of card play. And of course, it doesn't work to say multiple rounds of card play for each turn where the game lasts three rounds. It's not good terminology there, but I'm just going to roll with it. The bidding is akin to Reiner Knizia's Amon Ray. In that game, you have one location up for bid each round for the number of players in the game. And if someone outbids you, you have to go elsewhere. You don't have to go elsewhere. You can bid on the same lot, but you have to go higher, whatever it is. And then eventually everyone is going to get something. So sometimes you just want to push up the bid and hope that someone else will take the thing that they really need. They're going to pay for it. And you get to go somewhere else and get the zero, get something free and you'll go first in the next round. And of course they can stick you with something. Maybe it's all gonna work out for them. You can calculate things a little bit, especially at the end of the game, because there's less uncertainty of who is scoring what. Because in the last round, you're scoring everything. So you're looking, oh, I can put a five down on this to earn this 12. Okay, that's seven points. But what is the opportunity cost for playing that five versus going somewhere else or what it's worth to another player? Are they going to make out more as so you're trying to push everything up to, you know, make it more expensive for someone else where they feel they have to get something and then you go somewhere else cheaply or they have a green parrot and you're trying to make them pay higher for that, you know, non green tile so that they can keep that parrot at bay, not give it anything and still score. There's more considerations for how things are being valued and how they will score. It's not necessary for you to have this linear spatial element and fit everything together. It's an interesting puzzle in Balloon Pop, but with only eight rounds, sometimes things just don't come out. You don't get enough chances in order to put together the scoring package. I'm sure that's all by design. The game is designed to be a very quick play. I think the designer is giving the experience they want to give. It's just not ideal for me and what I'm looking for, where I'm not gambling quite so much. I'm still gambling in Right for the Insul, but it feels like there's more opportunities for me to make choices of when I want to push all in and when I want to stand back and when I want to take a chance on a, especially in the thunderstorm and you have the simultaneous bid, what cards do people have left in their hands and what do I think they're going to play? So there's more to think about as you're doing this stupid game about collecting bananas. I mean, it's a very dumb theme, but that's not what you're playing for. I don't, I don't care about the bananas. I'm caring about the other people who I'm competing with and trying to outthink them, you know, and see if I can end up getting a better position. So it's very cool. I want to play with more people just because I think it'll be more interesting to have more people at the table fighting for certain things. You can decide, you know, where you want to put your, your weight, your bid in order to get something. Maybe you just want to coast along and put zeros the entire game and see how that works out for you. I don't know. There's different possibilities for how you're going to play it out. At least it feels like there is versus Balloon Pop. Now, one element that doesn't work in either game is the color balance. Because if you look at uh, each player's color, well, they're the same. So the blue 10 is the same. Whoops. Where's the 10 go? Arr. The blue 10 is the same as the orange 10. So if you have color issues, you're not going to be able to easily distinguish who has bid where or what this is. Maybe that's clear that it's brown, brown, yellow, green. I don't have color distinction issues. So I'm not sure how easily you can distinguish those, but these are not clear. It would have been better to have one picture of a monkey or ape on all the player's cards so that I know I look at this character, that's all mine. And I look at this character and that's my green. And I look at this character and that's my yellow and so on. So that we don't have to ask questions because we did have one player in a game have to do that. You're like, what's my bid? I have to push this away. 
Or when someone is overbid, you can immediately give them back their card and they know just they just have to bid somewhere. But of course, you also want to know who you're competing against. So you still want to know the colors of the cards on the table. Balloon Pop has the same issue in that you're playing and bidding for the, the balloons and the red and green, there's nothing that's going to distinguish them. So you might have issues knowing what's what. Not much you can do about that, except if you added certain marks to all the balloons. You could have done something with the ape cards in Rife for the Insult to make that clear. Not sure why that wasn't a consideration or whether it just, they like the idea again, zero to 10, you go small monkey to large. There you go. Seems very straightforward, but it's missing an element where it would make things easier for people to play the game. Hmm. There you go. Two similar games. You get your own set of cards. You're going to bid for something. There's something for everyone every round. Are you going to get what you want? Do you get to put it in the right place? Is it going to work out for you in the end? Hmm. There you go. Same, but different. Out in 2023. On the shelves now. Will they be there in the future? Or will they be sold off in clearance? That's the question I also ask myself all the time. Every new game. How long is it going to last? How long will it be on the market? Will it stick around? Will you see it next season? Or will it be on clearance at that time? Is it a classic? Is there time for any game to become a classic at this point? Is things just going to be clear for the market so quickly? They'll just be gone? And all that's left is this video. Me talking about these games that no one ever sees again. Could be that. Bit of a ramble at the end here. But... I stand by that ramble.